Welcome to His Kim, a history show that helps us understand the science and technology world we live in. I'm Mikhail Meyer, a historian of science and editor of Chemical Heritage magazine here at CHF. And I'm Bob Kenworthy. I'm a chemist and also on staff here at CHF. Our show today is Digging Up the Bodies, debunking the CSI and other forensic myths. Our guests today are Lisa Rossner, a historian, and physical and forensic anthropologist, Anna Doty. So what does chemistry teach us about bodies? Anna? Well, I mean, let's face it, when you come down to it, we're all chemistry. And, and the whole de decomposition of bodies is, is a chemical act. I mean, it's, it's physical and it's chemical. Mm -hmm. So you have you know, insect activity, but you also have you know, the whole chemical reactions taking place. Mm -hmm. And from the moment you die, the, the, the literally just minutes after you die, your body mm -hmm. starts self-digesting. You know, we have a variety of different environments that you can die and either decompose or not decompose. And that's how the chemistry I I is involved. So for the instance, um, we have at the Mutter Museum, we have the soap lady. And she was preserved by saponification. And that's a, a chemical reaction whereby the body fat on the individual chemically alters into this adipocere. And that happens uh, when the body fat is encountered at a basic pH of the soil or whatever surrounding environment it's in. Um, it helps to have a water environment, a moist environment, but it's not completely necessary um, and an anaerobic situation. You combine all that together and this chemical reaction take pl takes place that transforms that fat into this adipocere material. And that uh, physically protects the body, but also insects don't like the way it tastes, so they won't, again, aid in that decomposition process. So that's a very good example, I think, of how, how chemistry is very important and for a uh, forensic anthropologist has to really understand the chemistry of the human body and, and what it's comprised of and what it breaks down to. We'll take a break for a few minutes uh, and watch a video of Anna working in her laboratory. Ooh. 150 years, you know, 100, 150 years ago, they didn't really understand that you shouldn't use certain types of adhesive, you shouldn't use certain types of material on bone because if they have um, an acidic pH, it can eat away at the bone. And so sometimes we're dealing with, you know, if they've stuck labels on it, we're trying to remove the adhesive because it's got an acidic pH or it's, it's um, not healthy for the bone. Anything that's acidic uh, on bone, it's going to eat away the minerals. Eat away the minerals, you're going to soften the bone it's going to crack, it's going to break, it's not, it's not good. So what you really want to do is just make sure there's nothing acidic um, touching your, your bones. It's not extremely high tech. Um, sometimes the best thing you can use is some distilled water and a Q-tip type, you know, a swab. Get it off that way. Um, sometimes, you know, we'll use ivory soap. Something very mild, that's the whole key, is very, very mild. and. Uh, that's basically what all there is to it. And uh, you'd be surprised how much you can go to get off with just a little, this is a little distilled water on the bone. Now you do have to be careful. You can see some of the bones um, in the back of the head are very sturdy, but some bones, like these are the palate bones, the roof of the mouth, that's not dark, that's translucent. And you could easily just go right through that if you're not careful. So you do have to take a bit of care, a bit of time, a bit of patience. drag us back to history for a moment okay. um, and actually talk about the origins of forensics as a science. I think really probably any time there was a well-developed justice system and a well-developed sense of scientific uh, method, which has been for lots of parts of the world, and also just people wanting to know, did, you know how did this blunt for, for how did this, this skull get caved in? You had people asking the kinds of forensic questions, but by the 17th and 18th century, so you have the two things coming together. One is the development of um, uh, scientific experimentation as something that is, that is widespread. Uh, chemists, um, doctors studying the body more and understanding its processes and doing experiments. And the other thing is you have uh, much more developed criminal justice system. Medical jurisprudence became a university subject. 
something that medical students were taught where uh, doctors could expect to be called as medical examiners. And, uh, and from that point on, I think, the, the juxtaposition of medical schools and law schools and, uh, and doctors and lawyers and criminals meant that it became a major field and a major force. I was asked by the United Nations uh, to go to Peru and to do human rights work. In Peru, it was something called uh, the Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path, mm -hmm. and there was uh, a lot of fighting in between the Shining Path and the government. And what we were trying to figure out is how many people died, and then if we could try to figure out if it was the Shining Path or it was the government. Mm -hmm. We had e estimated about 35,000 people had disappeared between about 1980 and 2000. And after I left, and, and I like to think that some of the work I did contributed to this, the Truth Commission came out and it was 75,000 people. To make that number, you have to have uh, tangible physical proof that there's that many people. In, in, and a lot of this was in mass grave context, and it's very hard to determine the exact number. What we do is we call so, it's something called the MNI, which stands for Minimum Number of Individuals, and you literally have to take all the bones and you, you sort them. I want to go back to your book. Okay. And the anatomy murders, which is about some truly spectacular crimes and lots of skullduggery. <laughs> yes. In 19th century Scotland, of right. all places. So, I'd like you to paint us a picture of the crime scene, as it were. Well, I'd like to describe uh, some of the processes. It is a little bit like a CSI, an early version of it. The alleged murderers were William Burke and William Hare, and they were Irish immigrants resident in Scotland. Um, and in Edinburgh, because of the medical school, there was a tremendous demand for cadavers. And so there was an obvious motive for the crime, which is that bodies brought uh, a very good price. They would hold down the victim and compress the chest so that the victim could not, could not um, breathe and cover his nose and mouth. So that's what they did to poor Maggie Dougherty. They compressed her chest, they uh, covered her, uh, her mouth and nose, and she suffocated. What happened was that, that Maggie Dougherty, her neighbors noticed that she was missing. Um, they called the police and they found the body. And then commenced the forensic investigation. 